All right, guys. Hey, it's Jonathan Edwards here. Welcome to another video or an audio, depending on where you are. But listen, a disclaimer, as always, I work with aspiring athletes and their families. These are families who've got big athletic dreams and they're really go for it. My advice is geared towards them. So with that in mind, some of that advice may not rub you the right way if you are not as into it or committed. If you aren't willing to take 100% responsibility for your athletic experience, if you're going to blame coaches, blame the weather, blame something other than yourself, it probably isn't the advice for you. So if you're going to hang out, that's fine. Leave appropriate comments where necessary. But again, just a little disclaimer, this advice isn't for everybody. So thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Let's get started. So the first topic tonight as um, uh, as controversial as controversial as it is, so you may be listening to me on Apple Podcasts later, you know, on your phone or uh, in your car or whatever. So um, I'm going to show. I'm just going to pull up some graphics here tonight, uh, just some websites and things. And so I'll try to do my best to explain them as we go. Um, so in case you're listening and uh, it can't um, can't see me, what we're going to be doing is I will be pulling off each question tonight, and we'll be posting those throughout the week on YouTube and. Uh, via our newsletter. So if you're not subscribed to our newsletter on athletespecific.com, please do so. Um, just download the, the automatic negative thought guide and you're on our list for free, which is good. And so uh, it's, it's getting busy this summer. I'm working with a, a fair bit of athletes and um, uh, and uh, you know, this is where a lot of the Tokyo Olympics is coming up too, which is finally, right, finally for some for athletes. But what's big in the news right now is this Naomi Osaka Um thing and there's a lot of there's a lot of learning to be had for our athletes kind of in this uh, rather interesting situation okay so uh, for those of you guys that uh, don't know who Naomi Osaka is she's a tennis player and she's the number one ranked tennis player in the world and she's uh, born in Japan uh, she competes under the Japanese flag so the so the Tokyo Olympics is coming up that's a big deal obviously it's in Japan Tokyo's in Japan in case you didn't know that, uh, and so Naomi is uh, is uh, she's lived in the United States since she was since she was three years old, and right now she's twenty three, and uh, she's really kind of came onto the scene in tennis in about twenty sixteen. So she played, she grew up in the U S. The U S. Tennis Association really didn't um, didn't really take her under their wing. They offered her kind of this opportunity when she was sixteen, and her and her parents turned it down, and uh, which which is cool. Like uh, that's uh, not that you know American tennis is like all that great, um, you know it, they, they and they don't feel they never felt slighted by it. That's not the point. So I don't want anybody going there. Or the uh, but the idea here is like, so last a uh, couple of weeks ago, uh, Naomi is at the French Open, and uh, she makes a comment online. Uh, about basically, and I'll, and I'll pull this up here on the websites. So for those of you guys that can see, this is her Wikipedia page. Uh, totally worth a read, by the way, for everybody to check that out. And then, um, so what she did was she, um, she like today, she withdrew from Wimbledon. And um, a couple weeks ago, so what she did was she withdrew from the uh, French Open. And so what she, she made a comment that basically went something like this. It said, um, uh, where's my quotes? If I can find it, I've often felt that people have no regard for athletes' mental health, and this rings very true. Whenever I see a press conference or partake in one, she wrote, "We're often sat there and asked questions that we've been asked multiple times before, or asked questions that bring doubt into our minds, and I'm just not going to subject myself to people that doubt me." Okay, so this is an interesting question, and I'm not one to say that that that. Um, that uh, um, that press conferences don't sometimes get weird, and the media asks like really weird questions, like even something as simple as like, "Hey, it seems like when you compete at night, you don't do very well, right?" Okay, so whether that's true or not, you know, the when the press asks it, it is a tough uh, question, right? And and it does deal with a little bit of doubt. But one of the interesting things about this in particular, what 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 it it, it it's uh it's really fascinating to me is that when you reach elite levels about of your sport uh it's not just about the sport anymore it's not about the doing of the thing and so the concept here is that to be 
successful as an athlete, right? You have your three key abilities, your physical, your technical, and your tactical abilities. But then it, the layers that wrap around that, the first one is your resources, the time, energy, and money you have to develop those abilities. But then the second layer that goes around that is your life skills and dealing with the press, dealing with the media. This is part of what being an elite athlete is, is about. It's, it's where in sport, it's, you rarely fall in love with the sport. If you're a fan of the sport, it's not just about the sport itself that you, you love, because if that were true, you would watch like robots playing. No, it's actually what you learn about the athlete. It's the backstory. And where do you learn about that? You learn about that through the press You and you learn about it through the good questions and also the tough questions, the difficult questions. And that's, and, and, and athletes can use that to their advantage, right? It's like, oh, you know, you have this intriguing thing about your background. Well, I have this intriguing thing about my, and I relate to you. And that's how we, that's how athletes become famous. That's because that's how they become brand ambassadors. That's how, you know, if a, if a product, you know, if a company selling a product resonates with that part of your backstory, then, then you're going to make a lot of money because that you can reach an audience with that part of your story. So as Sports is a business. It doesn't matter if you're a professional athlete like a tennis player or a basketball player, or if you are in some weird random sport like hurling in um, in Ireland, right? Like in or or something like you know rugby, which is a massively popular global sport. Yet if you're in North America, it's like yeah, what what rugby? Huh? Kind of heard about it, but it's not that big of a deal. But man, when you learn about those athletes and you learn about their story, then you go like, wow, I'm kind of interested in that now. Like you know, um, formula one race car driving did that for me before I was, I'm not a car guy, but I got wind of some stories of some athletes within that sport. And I was like, wow, I love like, that's cool. Like, let's go. And that drives the sport. So, so sports are a business. And part of that business is the accessibility of the athlete to the audience. And the primary driver for that is the media. And then on top of that, is an athlete's social media, right? So the media drives the athlete's popularity, which then drives the social media, and then social media then takes off on its own, <clears throat> okay? And so so while I totally appreciate what's, there's a couple of things I just wanna be clear on here. Yes, the media asks some really strange questions at times, and they raise questions that may or may not feel good. Um, but it is also part of the sport. And if you take it away, then you the sport loses a massive outlet. Okay. So what happened here is that so Naomi Osaka, she brought this up. And then what she what she talked about was that she it's really affected her mental health, mental health, and she's gone through bouts of depression because of it. Okay. So right now the world is incredibly sensitive to mental health issues and depression and things along those lines. But I'm going to, I will say something here that's going to be rather, it's going to rub people the wrong way when I say it. So I'm going to just give you the heads up right there is that athletes are ruining the conversation, the valid conversation around mental health. Okay. So I will start by saying this sport, sport, the game that you play doesn't care about your mental health. Okay. It doesn't. And, and, and the reason why I say that is because when there's a score, like right now I'm, I'm recording this in Euro 2020 is going on, which is a massive soccer event globally. For those of you that say soccer and football event, for those of you guys that know better. Um, but the thing is, is that, is that nowhere on the score, like, so, so just this last week, a, a player, uh, a guy by the name of Erickson keeled over of a heart attack in the middle of a game, three minutes to go before halftime, this dude keels over. Danish player, and he has to get resuscitated on the field, right? They had to defib him once and they got him back and that's great, but nowhere on the scoreboard. So the Danes lost that game. Nowhere on the scoreboard. Did it say, uh, I can't remember who they played, but they lost one, nothing. It didn't say asterisk 
oh by the way the guy had a heart attack and the rest of the team was done was was bummed out and they were they were depressed about their teammate and this it just doesn't it doesn't happen right and now what's interesting about the discussion about that was like the you know the 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 powers that be gave the team the option to either play that night later that night or the next day players chose to play that night and sure enough they're a bit D- um, they're about d- discombobulated. They lose, and of course, out in the press, it comes like, "Oh, the federations were bad. Like they sh- they rushed them, and that's 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 bad, and, and they should have been given more time." Whatever. Okay. But the bottom line is that sport doesn't really care about how you win or lose. Like we have in every sport we play, we have rules and regulations on the field of play, but then off the field of play. Okay. So doping is one set of rules. Also, we have professional organizations have media responsibilities right so so what happened here is that so Naomi brings this up and and when she she brings it up as like she's just speaking her mind and I totally appreciate that she's she's you know she's a young athlete and she's like you know these these press conferences bum me out and they freak with my head right and then and I don't need people you know asking me questions that that now I have to defend the doubt they're throwing in there and this goes to my kind of my like my voodoo um uh my my voodoo theory which is like you know you can basically voodoo an athlete if you ask them the right questions right or the wrong questions i guess but if i come up to you and i say like hey you feeling okay the first time you know if we have no relationship right and i come up to you out of the blue and i go hey you feeling okay you'll be like yeah why whatever dude get out of my face okay so now i come back a little later and i go wait w- wow are you you feeling okay? You might go like, well, okay, I've seen this guy twice now. And he said that twice. Like, yeah, I feel okay, whatever. But then I leave and you're like, well, do I look funny? Do I like, is my face? Like, whatever. Now, if I come back a third, if I come back again and again and again, I say, you feel, are you sure you're feeling okay? Like you may start to develop, you know, symptoms of like, you don't feel very good all because I've put that into your head. You know? And that's really what voodoo is all about. Now, if, if you, let's say we have a big relationship and I come up to you and I go, are you feeling okay? You might immediately go, oh, you know what? I sh- yeah, I haven't actually been feeling all that great. Like I'm a little pale and, and what, whatever. What are, you, what are you noticing? Like, like that's the voodooing of an athlete, right? And so, and the the press, the media are some of the worst ones. Um, and so, one of the things that I that this made me think about with this Naomi Osaka thing has been kind of percolating in the back of my head, and I was kind of I was resistant to talk about it, but then I saw a, an Instagram feed with Michaela Schifrin. And um, Michaela Schifrin uh, did a Instagram live with Patrick Dempsey, and so for all for all the Patrick Dempsey fans out there, like he also he's an actor, but he also races uh, race cars. Like he races in uh, Le Mans races, like big race race car races. He's a big race car dude. He used to have it in his contract as an actor that he could leave to go to a race if he wanted to. And so this Instagram live and i will put the link in the notes in the uh in the comment section so you guys can click on this but so for those of you guys that don't know who michaela schifrin is she is like the greatest skier of like all time and she is also in her early 20s and um a link's going to the comments right now uh so go check that out later don't leave me now but michaela schifrin last year her father died in a rather freak uh, accent. He slipped on the the front stairs of her house and uh, on the ice, hit the back of his head, and he was like in the hospital. And he works. He, I think he's an anesthesiologist as well. But her family is is ridiculously close, and she travels with her mom. and And her mom's like part of the coaching staff. and And her dad was like, you know, been there for like everything. And so this was a massive shock. So she leaves last season, doesn't finish the season, goes home. Although it was towards the end of the season. Uh, But this year she comes back and she races. And what happens here is, so she finished. So there's, there's five disciplines in ski racing. There's downhill, slalom, giant slalom, super G, and then what's uh, parallel, um, parallel slalom. So she only raced in two disciplines this year. And, and she, earned enough points by racing in two two disciplines in which she finished second overall in both she finished fourth overall in the world cup okay she did all her media appearances 
she found a way to basically manage the 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 loss and and so what being an elite level athlete requires a level of life skills that when you're raised as an athlete and let's say you're fairly introverted and by all accounts of Naomi Osaka she is very introverted and when she came on the scene and then she won and she won i think she's got four grand slams now i can't remember what she became an icon globally because she's japanese and she's like she's also got american influence there and she's she's got i think her dad's haitian and her mom's japanese like all these just amazing things going on here and the olympics are coming up she earned like 50 some odd million dollars last year in endorsement she's made a lot of money okay so let me ask you this if you're a very introverted person and all of a sudden you are the face of like women's sports globally. She also won the Laureus Sport Award, which uh, uh, female athlete of the year, which is a massive global sports sports award that a lot of us in North America we don't really we don't really hear a lot about. So she, you think that would cause some stress? You think you know you in in a certain amount of time you you know you now all of a sudden get thrown all this media at you? It would be a drag. I can, I can, and it would probably make you feel bummed out. And that bummed out feeling can also be then interpreted like, ah, oh, I'm de a lot of people, de you know, basically take that bummed out feeling and say, oh, I'm depressed. And now globally, the world hears the word depression and goes, oh my God, you know. But what I don't like about this, okay, so while that needs to be dealt with, okay, and when you listen to Michaela Schifrin in her interview with Patrick Dempsey, she talks about how she literally like, she tucked away the pain uh, of of um, she tucked away the pain of dealing with um, the loss of her father. Like she still hasn't dealt with it properly. From I think a lot of people would say that about her. But the idea is that she found a way to compartmentalize that and then fulfill her obligations as an athlete, not just to herself, but also to her sponsors and to her team, and to USA Ski and Snowboard and things like that. And so. I just share those two examples to give you uh, to, to, to basically let you know that that what everything that an athlete deals with they're basically skills and I remember the the fall before I competed in the Olympic Games one of our athletes Duncan Kennedy was attacked by neo Nazi skinheads leaving a bar in Oberhof East Germany and uh, and the next day we were like police escorted out of Eastern Germany to the border into Western Germany. Um, and uh, we went to Austria to our hotel and the next day like People magazine was there. Well, one of the things that we had done you know earlier that year by, by Bob Hughes was we had gone through media training and we learned and, and the company that that US Luge used was the same company that trained NASCAR races, na NASCAR racers with, with to and this was a time where NASCAR was like this hillbilly sport. And the media training came in and and helped these guys learn how to like talk about their sponsors and weave it in and get on to and just made it much more valuable. And that sport took off into what you see today. These are skills that can be learned. Okay. And when I first heard this stuff about Naomi Osaka, and 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 it's it, it's so, uh, I feel like it's so human or so American to just blame. Just say like I I I want this to change. That's great. But what I want my athletes to understand is like you can't complain about the weather. You can only prepare for it, right? And so, in the second segment today, I'm going to talk about 100% responsibility, um, and and the, the the concepts around that. But but one of the things that happened here is that so on the flip side, you've got Naomi Osaka, but then on the other side, you have Michaela Schifrin as a perfect example of like of like someone who's just taken a. a the 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 approach the responsibility to go all right how do i deal with this and now the other story i'll share with you is that um in formula one racing last year there's a guy by the name of alex albon who who raced for red bull okay and i couldn't help but watch the this naomi osaka thing evolve and just go like her team needs to be better around her they need to protect her better and I think if you if you watch on Netflix, uh, the Drive to Survive series on Netflix, which is fantastic, even if you're not a Formula One race fan, you watch Drive to Survive, you will be. Well, there's a scene in there where they talk about Alex Albon, who is actually from the Philippines. And 
it turns out his mom spent time in prison for like some sort of fraud. I think some sort of business fraud, big deal. But there's a scene where Alex Albon is about to sit down to do a uh, a media a one on one with a with a, a British newspaper, a British outlet of some sort, media outlet of some sort. But with Alex Albon is the Red Bull press chief or one of their press team, and the press chief is ahead of the game here. And I can guarantee you that Naomi Osaka does not have someone like this that acts in this way. They, she might have somebody who's like her press person or her media person or her PR person, but they're not acting the way this Red Bull press person did for Alex Albon because they sat down and this press guy got in front of it and said, I'm not going to allow you to ask a string of questions based on Alex's mom. Okay. And and so, so basically, I mean, the, the interview gets kind of cut. The Netflix footage gets kind of cut. But I can only imagine that this got got cut short. And and a little bit of banter goes back and forth where it says, the the press chief says, I know you have a job to do. Or maybe the press guy says, I have a job to do. There are limits to that. And so for Naomi Osaka, I'm on board with that type of thing. Like if, it, you know, if a, if a, if a, press scrum after your match is digging into weird stuff or stuff that you've talked about a thousand times. It's like, wait a second, let's put a, let's put an end to that. Uh, and I think that's fair. I really think that's fair. Uh, but press people are paid to ask questions and then get different answers from you. Right. And so that's, again, that's part of it. But the idea here is that, is that what I love that comes out of all this is that for an athlete, your athlete may enjoy their sport and like the doing of the thing, right? So I can imagine as a skier, Michaela Schifrin loves to ski as, you know, Naomi Osaka loves to play tennis and both of them are quite reserved. Like, uh, Michaela is a little bit more vocal, a little bit more extra has a little bit more extroverted qualities. Naomi though, from all, everything that I've read about her, she's very introverted. And so you can imagine how, like, if you're very introverted, being extroverted is an uncomfortable feeling. Whereas if you have the ability to learn how to be that way, and Michaela Schifrin has talked about that, where she in the past used to be really shy and she has had to come out. And if you've watched her career, you can see this. It's a skill to learn. It's not something to be avoided. And so while Michaela Schifrin has kind of embraced that, Naomi Osaka has, has backed out of it. And then what's come of, of course, what's as the media has jumped on this, it, or the world has jumped on this, it plays the media in a very bad light. And I don't think that's fair. Okay. I don't think that's fair. Because if you think about this, you can only ask for the environment to change so much and then it will only change so what's happens is that she dropped out of the french open okay all of the open organizers the us open the french open um the australian open um what's the one i'm forgetting new york open australian yeah. well wimbledon she just dropped out of wimbledon too but she also has the olympics coming up she's, she's prepping for that okay but People, the, those four, um, those four organizations came out and said, "Listen, we're going to fine our athletes if they don't do press conferences. We are going to, they, they will default if necessary. That's their rules, and those rules, I think, are their. I mean, it's their business. And Naomi Osaka has now. This is this is what a lot of people lean towards. She's made a lot of money, and like who you know." If she's more made made more money than you, that's okay. But there's you can never judge an athlete by the money that they make or don't make. By the way, that's just weird. All right, it's it's insensitive and it doesn't make a lot of sense. But people will say like, "Oh, she's made a lot of money." Here's what happens in the grand scheme of tennis right now for Naomi Osaka. Dealing with all this crap is not worth it. And and I've written about this before. Like when values and performance collide. Right. So, so you have an athlete going like, all right, I'm, yeah, I'm the best in the world. I'm, I make a ton of endorsement money. I'm the face of women's sports, but I'm not dealing with this crap anymore. So she has some play, but one thing that I've always, that I tell all my athletes in any sport, no matter what the level is that the program that you were part of is going to be here long after you're gone. Okay. 
And depending on what you demand of the program, there are self there there and this is this doesn't matter if you're you're a, a world class tennis player now bring up a discussion about how the media treats athletes fair okay but there will be a point where like tennis is going to continue to go long after she's part of the sport and that may end tomorrow we don't know right same thing goes for Michaela Schifrin like skiing was going to be around long after she is done as a skier and I'm all for being you know for fighting for change and things along those lines but I'm also more about teaching athletes to understand that, you know what, if I'm a competitor of Naomi Osaka, I now see a major weakness in her. Fair? Right? This is where sport doesn't care about your mental health. It doesn't care about if you're depressed or not. It doesn't care if you're having your period or it doesn't care if your dad just died. You come out to compete today. And as harsh as that may sound, you come out to compete today. And you may have a bad day because of what is going on in your life, but this athlete may have a better day because they can handle the same thing better than you can. And that's really important to understand. And this is where I say rather harshly, sport will never care about mental health. Why? Because there is an athlete willing to push it further and to go into more difficult situations and to learn those skills with which to manage it. And that's that's hard for a lot of people to swallow, right? We are in a, in a culture of blame, right? We are in a culture of partisanship and all this stuff. And, and, and you know, I, I, knew, I knew this past week that the, the conversation about mental health and athletes is is going the wrong way. When I read the story about an athlete, um, when I read the story about an athlete who he goes to Navy, he's a football player, and he got basically signed by an NFL team. Yet he has he has a a, a responsibility to Navy to serve. I can't remember the term what they call it, but he's got to spend two years um, deployed. And so his agent wrote, and this was on ESPN. His agent wrote that. The decision of Navy to force this athlete to not to forgo going into the NFL and to have to serve, the, the, his agent said that this will, this could affect his mental health in the long term. So right there, the agent has basically used mental health as like a like a threat, and I'm like, dude, you've just ruined it for everybody, okay? Because one, if you project that on your athlete, it's just like a press person throwing doubt at Naomi Osaka in a press conference, right? Like, hey, I heard you're bad on Sunday nights. Yeah, and you've got a and you've got a match on Sunday night. Like, what do you what do you think your chances are? Okay, now she has to defend that. Well, the same thing for this like football guy. Now his agent's saying, like, well, you're gonna have mental health problems if this doesn't work out. That's basically how that could be translated. It doesn't help anybody. What I want for your athlete is an understanding of this, is that in sport, you are going into a competitive environment, okay? Your physical, technical, and tactical abilities are going up against another athlete's physical, technical, and tactical abilities. Michaela Schifrin this year went up against her competitors and only doing two of the disciplines, right? Not all five. She earned just, she earned enough points to finish fourth overall. Like that's like you know, that's like skiing with your eyes closed, right? If she had done one more discipline and earned like roughly 400 points, like finished second overall, she would have won the overall the year after her father died in some crazy, you know, in, in some crazy freak accident. So she's learned that skill. We have examples of athletes who are able to, and I want my athletes to be ready for anything, right? If And when we got media training after our teammate got attacked by neo-Nazi skinheads, we learned how to deal with the press. It's a skill. To say that dealing with the press is affecting my mental health, What I when I hear someone talk about like they have mental health issues or they suffer from depression, I, I believe that they don't have mental health issues and they don't suffer from depression. They suffer from a lack of, I haven't figured this out yet. That's what's happening. Right. And so, so that's really what I want to encourage my athletes to understand is that everything is figure outable, right? 
and and the and the idea that you you know you have to feel it's like an athlete who goes into an event and 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 lacks a little bit of confidence that that feeling that sits in their belly the goal is not to get that that feeling gone it's to deal with it's to learn how to to, to work in spite of that feeling right and to develop the courage to work around that feel like that the Susan Jeffers book called feel the fear and do it anyway right talks about talks about stuff like that so that's that's something where you know i i'm sure this whole naomi osaka thing will go so she dropped out of wimbledon but that's also convenient because she has the tokyo olympics right around the corner and she as an athlete she stands to uh reap more from that if you look at that of winning the olympics in her home country uh than by winning an you know another wimbledon and that's an interesting thing like that's what we're seeing with athletes now is that these events used to be the pinnacle of their career but now with social media and now with the ability to to develop like you know naomi osaki is a tremendous activist like she uses the media to talk about black lives matter and other issues that are important to her and that's fantastic media is a tool so on one side media is a tool for her but in this particular case she's saying that it's 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 not good for her mental health and it's giving her bouts of depression. Okay. Well, that could be construed as convenient. All right. But again, we have to be mindful. If an athlete is feeling bad, what can we do to help them feel better? And in this case, it's not like, oh, the world should change and the media should change and all this stuff. Athletes use the media. And so if I have an athlete coming up in a sport of tennis, I go, man, if you can learn these skills and you get up against Naomi Osaka, there's going to be people that pay off the media to ask her tough questions. It's just going to happen. Why? Because they're competitors and competitors find ways to win sometimes outside of the, outside of the lines in the gray areas. Right. And people get shocked when I even say something like that. Right. So you can either curse at the rain or bring an umbrella. What do you want to do? Right. I would rather my athletes get, get, get their head straight and, and bring an umbrella right? And know what's going on. So these are skills to learn and they're not easy. And especially if your personality is such where you're not necessarily inclined to be disagreeable or things along those lines. Um, you know, I want, I want just people to understand that your athlete can learn anything that they want to. All right. So let's keep that in mind. I know this is a tough one and I, and people have called me like insensitive to Naomi Osaka. I'm not, I'm actually pro athlete because what I'm realizing is her team is lacking some serious ability to protect her as an athlete, to manage some of these things. They could have gotten ahead of this, but they didn't, but we're going to learn that the hard way.